Welcome to episode 19 of Inside Politics, for teens, by teens, where I explore the politics and issues impacting our generation. I'm your host, Christina Lee, and today I'm focusing on state politics. For this, I've invited Representative Campbell, a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives representing the 15th Essex since 2007. So Representative Campbell, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, you know, this is, this is really um, a true uh, pleasure and an honor, uh, Christina, to be here. Um, these are very, um, I think, important times uh, for all of us uh, in our democracy. And so um, I'm very thankful for, for what you're doing and, and the involvement of, of teens right now. It's really important. Awesome. So let's get let's get into it. So um, for those watching who aren't that familiar with how the state government works, could you give a quick overview of the structure of it and how your position specifically fits into it? Sure. So um, every state is a little bit different, right, in their in their structure. Uh, and uh, some have um, full-time legislatures, sometime. some have part-time legislatures, depending on you know, the population of the state. Uh, Massachusetts has a full-time legislature. So that means, um, and we are on a regular, we get paid a regular salary for this full-time representation. So, uh, but the structure is essentially uh, the model that we see at the federal level. We have a governor, who is the chief executive, and he has um, a uh, a large administration, as we have similarly at the federal level with secretaries um, in the major areas, usually um, you know health and human services, uh, public safety, um, environmental um, structures, um, and so uh, it's it's very analogous to what we have at the federal level. And it's uh, just in a, a, a uh, smaller uh, portion, if you will. And in Massachusetts, as I mentioned, we have a full-time legislature. And it consists of 40 senators um, and 160 reps. Uh, and uh, we meet uh, formally all the time. And uh, we also have a Supreme Judicial Court system um, similar to what you have at the federal level, it mirrors in that regard as well. And then, um, you know, at the state level, in individual cities and towns, the structures tend to vary substantially. So, you know, the city of Boston has a city council, which is full time, and uh, it, it, you know, engaged in, in, in a daily basis um, to address it. Uh, you know, specific issues affecting the city, whereas some of the smaller towns in Massachusetts, they still have uh, what we call like um, uh, a town um, participation where the voters come, right? They have a meeting and they vote on various uh, government um, uh, structures and issues affecting the town, like the budget and so forth, and they vote directly. And, and so this, um, this is the, you know, there's a wide variety of, um, of structures within cities and towns. Uh, but at the state level, again, it, it mirrors what we have at the federal level. And the only thing I will add right now is that you, we have had a lot of gridlock uh, at the federal level. And so uh, a large uh, responsibility for governing in all the areas um, that our government is required um, to legislate, we're doing it at the state level. So state government has become uh, much more important in, in the last, you know, I would say eight years, uh, simply because there's been a lot of gridlock and, and partisan um, infighting in, at the federal level. And as a result, there's a lot of legislation that is just not moving forward, but we need to get the job done, <laughs> right? We can't wait. And so uh, it's been a, um, a very, very uh, productive but um, challenging year for, for state government. So really over the last uh, eight years. There's another difference too in state governments versus federal governments. We have to present a balanced budget. The federal government can borrow money um, and, and carry um, really a substantial amount of debt. 
uh, we can't do that at the, at the state level. And so right now um, with COVID-19, we are, um, you know, our budgets are very impacted by this virus. And there's been a big downturn in revenue that we're getting from taxpayers and businesses. So it's been very, very challenging. Understood. So I know you mentioned, mentioned the pandemic um, affecting your work. So how has that affected your day-to-day -day responsibilities as well? Oh my goodness. Um, in so many different ways. We, um, we pretty much, uh, at the end of a two-year session, our, we have what we call a two-year session in Massachusetts where typically bills get filed at the very beginning of the, that two-year session. So any bills that we want to file as legislators, we, we try and file them very early on because the process is very rigorous um, and it's very difficult. Um, about 10,000 bills get filed at the beginning of the session. Very, very few will get through at the end. Um, so it, it's uh, kind of like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. And so uh, what happened when COVID hit was that all that regular legislation that was moving forward on some really important topics came to a standstill. And we had to pivot um, and figure out how we were going to address COVID because all of the um, actions that Governor Baker uh, can take uh, in Massachusetts to help with COVID, um, most of them have uh, a requirement for legislative input. Um, and so we had to pivot really and focus specifically on COVID. And so most of the legislation that we have been passing you know over the last six months has been really directly related to covid um, how are we going to help the spread uh, what laws are we going to put in place to help that um, uh, how are we going to help uh, businesses financially um, to get through this um, you know we're probably going to lose 40 percent of our restaurants in massachusetts they're never coming back this is very, very sad. Um, and so how are we going to help the individuals that don't have jobs? And how are we going to um, get the medical equipment that hospitals need to care for patients? You know, there was a big shortage of, of all of the PPE equipment that hospitals needed. How do, how do we get a hold of that? How do we pay for it? Um, and so how do we, um, you know, set up more structures, text structures for people to work at home. And then you, how do we educate students? You know, that's, that's our big challenge that's in front, of, in front of us today as legislators, because we have, um, you know, a need to educate students, but the flu season is approaching. Some of communities in Massachusetts have seen a recent spike in, in their COVID um, infections. Uh, so right now, I think the, con the, the challenge of educating our students is, is front and center. And we need to provide school systems a little bit more money because they have a lot of things that they have to do that they didn't have to do before. And they don't have the money to do that. You know, cities and towns are losing a lot of taxpayer money too if, as businesses go out of business. And many people are unemployed. Um, and so they're not paying their taxes. And one of the things that we did was we deferred um, annual taxes for individuals. Um, we said, we understand um, that, you know, you're in very dire straits, your family is in very dire straits. So we're gonna defer your tax payment. Um, but of course that makes it more challenging on our end, right? Because we don't have as much money in the piggy bank um, to give to, those um, that are that are in need in the state. So uh, it's uh, COVID has pretty much taken over. And one thing that we did in the legislature, because there were some really important pieces of legislation that were pending, that had gone through a very rigorous process. And now they're in conference. There's a House bill and there's a Senate bill, and they're in a conference committee to try and resolve the differences. There's a lot of legislation that is still in conference. And so we extended um, our voting session 
normally we we stop voting um, in August, uh, and so we extended that formal session uh, right up until the new the new legislature is sworn in, usually like on the third of January. So big, big change, big effect yeah. from COVID. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, not surprising. Yes. So, I guess in general, what values and causes do you personally champion as a state representative? And I guess this is like even more important in this kind of emergency pandemic situation. Right, right. I think that this um, pandemic situation is revealing a lot of the uh, vulnerabilities of government. Uh, I think they're becoming more stark more clear and um and so a big um you know we we know this for sure we see it that there's tremendous disparities in the health care that people um are receiving and uh it you know lower income folks um tend to have and folks um uh, uh latinos and and the black community and many others right have disproportionately um, suffered as a result of this virus. In other words, there's been many more deaths um, in their communities from this virus. And so these numbers have been laid starkly in front of us. And so, you know, the, the um, importance of our community hospitals, not our big research hospitals in Boston, right? Um, they get typically a lot of good funding from private insurance, right? but our community hospitals where people have less income are carrying a very, very heavy burden right now to care for um, uh, individuals in their communities. Um, and they simply don't have the capacity and, 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 and the funding to do that. So that has become crystal clear to everyone. And that's a, that's a huge challenge. So I think that um, for myself, you know, um, I think um, justice and fairness for healthcare for all. Um, not necessarily that policy where everyone has to be on a government policy, but we certainly have to come up with a system that allows for a public option because what we're doing right now is clearly not working. And it was tr tragically played out in, in, in with this virus. Um, I think um, income inequality um, in Massachusetts is extraordinarily high. It's um, reflective, I think, of income inequality across the country. Um, we have 1% of our population um, really that um, is, is reaping in 40% of our gross domestic product. And you can't, in my opinion, right, sustain a democracy when you have such great wealth inequality. In other words, Money is power, right? And so you have to ask yourself, do we want 1% of our population making the rules in a democracy? So to me, income inequality um, is a big issue in Massachusetts. We, we have um, greatly increased and in moving towards um, a, a full and minimum wage um, for folks. And we're, we're, we're very close to achieving that but there's still tremendous wealth inequality in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because we have what I consider to be a regressive tax structure. In other words, a poor person pays 5% of their salary to us for taxes and a wealthy person does the same. And so for that poor person, 5% of their salary is a huge amount of money. For a wealthy person, it's not, right? So we need some kind of uh, graduated tax system where we ask our more wealthy um, citizens to, to contribute more. And um, so that's a, that's a really important um, issue for me. Uh, uh, another important issue is um, civic education for youth. I sponsored a piece of legislation that was signed into law uh, that was uh, perhaps, I think, um, one of the more Im important and rewarding things that I will do as a legislator. So in Massachusetts now, civics is required to be taught in our school systems. And not only is civics required to be taught moving forward, it's like a six year program that, that will start um, in the junior high grades and proceed through high school. And what I love about it, um, and we fought hard for this, is that 
there will be a project um, associated with this learning so that students are required to do some hands-on engagement on, on something that's important to them. You know, it might be something related to school. It might be something related to the environment. It, it can be things that really directly impact their lives, like should high school start earlier or later in the morning, right? Should we have the little kids start school earlier and, you know, our high school students start later? Right now it's flipped, you know, the other way around. It can be issues that really directly impact them, um, or it can be something that they're really intellectually interested in. So the um, uh, engaging our youth is a, a total priority of mine, and it continues to be. This law is passed now, but I'm not stepping away from that because it has to be implemented, right? Teachers have to be receive training on it. Um, money has to be spent to make sure that we have uh, what we need for the teachers to, to do this. And the teachers are really excited about this, by the way. They are hugely excited about this. Um, so I, I want to stay engaged um, very much on that issue. Engaged is kind of a political term right now, but I, I want to be involved in that issue um, all the time, even though the law is passed, um, because I firmly believe, I was a, a history major in, in college, that all change comes from below, right? But all change usually comes from young people. It's when, it's when younger generations get engaged and say, We're, there needs to be a change. And when you look at the history of our country, say, you know, the Vietnam War be, is an instant example, I think, that comes to everyone's mind. But the impact that younger generations had on ending the Vietnam War was, was phenomenal. I mean, they, they made it happen, really. So I think that um, it has to be part of our culture in our country that we start to um, make sure that the next generation and generations before them are very comfortable with understanding and knowing how to impact uh, politics and, and public policy. And that you can't, that has to start early um, and it's not just voting, right? They have to know how to impact the system, right? Um, and there's so many levers that have to be pushed to, to change a policy or a direction. Um, there's multiple levels that have to be pressed at the same time. And I, I think it's important that future generations learn what those levers are. <laughs> and they also learn how government impacts them in a very direct way. They usually don't realize that Till they try and go rent an apartment or buy a car, right? Or, or, or pay their electric bill um, or borrow money, right? Um, and they go, holy gamoli, right? Look at my tax bill, right? How do they expect me to pay this tax bill, right? So I, I think that we have to engage your generation and um, generations that are gonna follow you um, they have to understand that um, they have to be um, engaged or other people are going to make the rules for them. And they shouldn't be comfortable with people like me, right, making all the rules for someone to follow me. People need to be impacting that. And so I think what we're doing this morning, but generally speaking, what you're doing is, um, is so important. Thanks. So yeah, no, that's an amazing piece of legislator because I know that in eighth grade, I learned like about the federal government, but we never really did any hands-on work. And I think one of the most, um, I think one of the obstacles that kids like that teens face is thinking that the voting age is when they have to start, like is when they should getting in, start getting involved and they right. wait until they're 18. But the thing is, you can't just wait for that switch to flip and then you instantly just like throw yourself into politics because it doesn't work that way, right? You have to like start building upon your skills from a young age. And I think that bill is awesome. Right, well, thank you. I mean, thank you. Um, I think it's really exciting because I think it comes at the right time. And, um, and uh, you know, again, there's still a lot of work to do because we have to make sure that the funding is there for it. Um, but I do think that we, I think that our recent history in our country has, has really caught the attention of a lot of future generations. 
And um, I think that I look at the whole Black Lives Matter movement and I, I observe like everyone else, the number of young people that have been, that have become involved in this issue. And it has had a huge impact. And like you said, um, it's, not, it's not just voting, right? Because um, to have an impact, you, you have to be engaged in many different ways. You have to learn, uh, one of the aspects of the legislation that I think is really important is making sure that students um, and, and future generations understand that they need to get their information from a, a wide variety of sources because everyone, um, with, the, with, the, you know, with the advent of cable news, everyone has a slant and they're coming at it from um, their perspective, whoever owns that particular news media outlet. Um, there's an agenda there, if you will, okay? Um, and students need to really understand that they can go from one media outlet to another and hear completely divergent opinions. And they need to understand that they can't just look at one, that they have to look at um, a broader source of information. And um, I think if we accomplish that, that will be very, very helpful for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a lot to it, you know? Um, and, um, and local politics has a huge impact on people's lives, you know? And so we, we automatically just think um, the federal government, but most of the change comes at the state level, to be honest with you. Um, that's where it starts. And then what happens is if something works at the state level, we pass a law and it works, then the federal government usually looks at that for a couple of years and says, okay, this is working in Massachusetts, right? Do you think that this might work in Wyoming? Um, and so we tend to be the incubators for pretty much all of uh, federal law. And um, I'll just give you an example. One of the issues that I'm very passionate about is the environment. And I've been involved um, around issues around uh, making sure that the Merrimack River is safe uh, for drinking water and, and also for recreation. And I, a, a, a bill was just passed in the House, it's in conference with the Senate, to require notification if any kind of sewerage is spilled into the river so that people can become aware of that. And when um, people need to know that information if they're recreating on the river and we get our drinking water. So what, what occurred then is, is Seth Moulton, um, who's a congressman in Massachusetts, contacted us and said, I'd like to file this bill at the federal level. Can, can you work with us? And so this is the type of thing that happens all the time. We tend to be the incubators. Um, and if it works here, then maybe it might work. But we have a big country, you know, and so it's hard because what works in Massachusetts might not necessarily work in Wyoming. And, and that, applies, that applies here as well. What works in Boston doesn't necessarily work in a small town in Western Massachusetts. So it's, it's very challenging um, to pass legislation because it has to work across a, a, a broad spectrum of circumstance. So it's complicated. No, I think that totally makes sense because I think, I think people definitely overlook the fact that um, instead of just focusing on the federal level government, you do need to set sort of some sort of like precedent at like a smaller scale in order for them to adopt legislature, which I think that just um, further um, supports the importance of the state government and in getting involved, right? Right, and, and at the local level as well. And um, I, would, I would really encourage, um, I would really encourage um, all, all generations to, uh, to do that because as I said before, we know that the population 50 and over are gonna become involved and, and that they make the rules, right? So we really need pressure and input at all levels of government um, to make sure that the voices of the future are heard. And, um, and unless we have that pressure put upon us, um, we're, you know, elected officials, um, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's uh, super hard. I, I wouldn't change my job for anything in the world, but um, I think that, um, you know, everyone understands that sometimes the squeaky wheel 
gets the grease and that's not always the best thing to happen but it's because we have so much coming at us at once and so little you know limited amount of time to process what we have um i think that if future generations can learn how to um to communicate with us to to be part of the conversations um that we will definitely ensure that those voices are heard um but time being time right um it's important that they reach out to us that you reach out to us um because we're just so flooded and our time is so limited um that it's it's um it's hard for us sometimes to spend the time that we should reaching out to you so it's really helpful when you reach out to us because that just makes everything so much easier to to uh to work with you Got it. So I think that's some great advice to end on. Um, thank you so much, Representative Campbell, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see everyone next time on Inside Politics. Hi, everyone. This is Christina. Thank you so much for watching Inside Politics. And please feel free to check out the rest of the interviews on my channel. See you next time.